am a Colombian. I am 26 years old, but I'm based in the Netherlands. And uh, that's what I do. I'm a software engineer at Container Solutions, and I help companies with uh, transitions into distributed structure and all that. Well, I'm going to be talking about the, the strategy on how to actually do DevOps, because most people think that it's just about the, te the technology, but people also forget about the human side of things. So I'm going to make a lot of emphasis into that. Oh, yeah, check. One, two, three, go. So, hello, everyone. You guys are late. You should be ashamed of yourselves. That was my talk. Thank you guys for coming. See you next time. Yeah, woo. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, baby. That's right. Um, as, you, as you realize, I'm uh, Carlos Carlos. I'm a software engineer at Container Solutions, originally from Colombia, based in the Netherlands now. Uh, I Somebody was asking, like, hey, who is a DevOps engineer, full stack developer, whatever. Like, I am that. I am also the guy that makes the coffee. I'm the guy that makes the call. I'm the guy that does the networking, the marketing, talking to customers, speaking of requirements, making sure that the product is delivered. Like, I do a lot of stuff. So in the past couple of years, I've had the experience, uh, the opportunity to experience uh, driving changes within companies, implementing, or companies that wanted to do DevOps, but they were not really sure what they were doing. So I am going to take this experience, and I'm going to bring it to you guys today so that if you're trying to drive change within your companies, you can take some bullet points from here, bring it back to your companies, and hopefully help your whole company with that transition. With that being said, I want to make a small parenthesis here. Do we have any uh, free flight pilots in the audience, like paragliders, hang gliders, sail gliders, base jumpers, wingsuiters? No? So it's just nerds. OK, no, it's, it's good. Now we're on the same page. So let's go. You can find me on the social networks uh, as Mongreleon, Twitter, LinkedIn, and, and the rest. That's my email in case you have questions. After we're done with the Q&A and everything, uh, I would still love to answer the questions that you might have. I understand that some of you guys are shy to ask your questions in public. That's totally cool. Find me afterwards, and we can discuss whatever matter is bothering you. So a couple of privilege checks. I want to make sure that before we go, uh, we are all on the same page, so we should all know about computers. Do we have any graphic designers in the room? What are you doing? Oh, wait, hold on. You're taking the pictures, of course. <laughs> so, so, sorry. I was like, if there is a graphic designer in the crowd, he's totally out of place. Uh, so we need to know about virtualization. You should by now have some sort of experience with virtualization so that you can sort of keep up with what we're going to be talking about today. Container technologies is a good to know, but not necessarily a must. You don't need to have you don't need to have hands-on experience just to know what it is. CI/CD, CI/CD pipelines. We've been talking about that throughout the whole day. I've been loving all the talks. It's so much great insight into how companies are tackling these problems. I hope that you guys are also learning a lot from it. Uh, programmable infrastructure, which is tied with um, with virtualization and CI/CD. And today, then I want to give you guys a little story. Who is not familiar with this? There is one, two, three, four hands. You guys need to step up your game. This is Dilbert. This is the representation of every single developer in the world. And uh, one day, Dilbert comes to his office, and he's doing uh, automated deployments. The way that it goes is he writes some COBOL code Right? because people still write COBOL nowadays. He commits, he pushes, that, that commit gets picked up by a certain entity, a robot, maybe a Jenkins or something like that. It runs tests on that code that Dilbert wrote. It is then going to build an artifact, a deployable unit, is going to back it up somewhere in some sort of repository, and then that artifact is going to get picked up undeployed into a certain stage and environment, and if that deployment works, it is then going to be promoted into production in the very same way that it was deployed into staging automatically. So how many of you guys are doing this already at your companies? Raise your hands and keep them up. So for the other ones, look around. This is as much people, as many people are doing this right now professionally. So you can see in the room we have, you can put your hands down now, thanks. Uh, and there is a lot of people that are not yet there, and there are many, many reasons on why this is not yet happening in, in every single company in 2017. So let, let's, uh, let's look uh, a little bit into that. Okay, so here's a diagram uh, explaining more or less how it works. Somebody codes, some tests, 
Git or Maven or Subversion, whatever that is, but hopefully Git. And then the build server picks it up, and then some environment is being the the deployable unit is being deployed to a certain environment, and then after some point it gets deployed to production. There is some monitoring going on so that you can tell what is going on within the system, and then the users can interact with your application. This is pretty straightforward. I'm gonna make these slides available online later on, so if you wanna take a look at it. So now the real story that I wanna bring you guys today is, we went to, um, one of our customers calls us and says, hey guys, we're having troubles with Jenkins and Ansible. Can you come over and help us out? And I was the one in charge of the, the project, so I go there. I said, okay, show me your Ansible Jenkins problems. And they had 99 problems. Ansible and Jenkins was not one of them. The problem was underneath. The problem was in the conception. If you guys attended the talk from Mark Heistek earlier on, on sudo install DevOps, there was one question somebody was asking, what is better to have experience or mentality? And Mark said mentality, and in a DevOps context, it matters a lot and it is the right answer. The mentality matters is the most important because you can bring a CI-CD pipeline, you can come as a consultant, you fix the CI-CD pipeline for your customer, but if the, the developers do not understand how the whole thing works, they're just gonna do waterfall on top of your agile methodologies that you implemented. They're gonna fuck it up. So mentality in that sense uh, is what really matters. So this customer, um, he is the CTO of a Eastern European payment gateway, a very famous one. I cannot mention the name because of NDA reasons. But, so we come and, and we realize, okay, guys, you are not, you're not doing things right and it's because of, of, of the culture of the people. But what, the, what the, CTO, the CTO said is, okay, from today on, we shorten our sprints from three weeks to two weeks and we're gonna start doing CI-CD pipeline. We're gonna use Docker, we're gonna do orchestration, we're gonna do programmable infrastructure with Ansible, and we're gonna use Jenkins and blah, 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 blah. He had the whole idea right, because he had been going out there and seeing what other companies had been doing, and then he realized, yes, we need that if, if we want to keep up with the market. And so he, he comes to the company, he tells this to the managers, because he, he doesn't have the knowledge nor the authority to go to the developers and say, hey, do this, do that. So the managers come up with a strategy, okay, how are we gonna do this? And so they say, well, we need to create definitely a DevOps team. We need to um, figure out which uh, tools we're gonna use, maybe some sort of containerization tool, maybe some sort of um, configuration management tool. So they picked up Docker and they picked up Ansible uh, and they started building the knowledge in-house. In, in so going to the definition of strategy, from the old Greek, whatever that is, is a high level plan to achieve goals under conditions of uncertainty. And take a closer look at the word uncertainty because when you're going to apply DevOps and you're a new company or you're an comp existing company applying a new methodology, there is a lot of uncertainties. There's a lot of known unknowns and a lot of unknown unknowns. So there is a lot of uncertainty going on. But the guy was smart to gather the managers and have them come up with a strategy because you want to kind of be ready for whatever happens. You can never be 100% ready for every single situation, but you can do your best. So that's what they were trying to do. They created a DevOps team, containerize every single application, have a DevOps team to create the CICD pipeline, programmable infrastructure with Ansible, deploy all the applications in the new infrastructure, and profit. So the good thing about this strategy is the part of the profit, create a DevOps steam, containerize, have the blah, 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 huh, huh. So the whole thing, the whole idea, the whole strategy was great. The problem or the bad was that they were trying to do too many things at the same time. DevOps, CICD, programmable infrastructure. If you can see the whole thing, the three sub projects or the three topics are projects themselves and they're very vague and they started containerizing a bunch of applications that doesn't work. So our diagnosis was that the customer suffered of myopia, which is when you cannot see uh, far ahead, right? What, what, what you nerds have with the glasses. I don't use glasses, this is just fashion. Another thing that they fail to understand is that change is difficult. Change is painful, is hard, is unknown, challenging, and people don't like challenges, even though they say they want. They like challenges, it's uncertain, and it's unpopular. Whenever you go to a company and you tell them, we're gonna change the way that we work, 
And people, even though they might seem enthusiastic about it, and even though they say, yes, we want change, deep, deep inside, they don't want. We don't want. It's part of our nature. Once we have learned how to cope with a certain way, with a certain ecosystem, we adapt to it real fast, and then we don't want anything to change, because then the uncertain comes, and that creates a lot of stress. So change is really, really hard, and that's what the company felt at seeing. But what is worse, what they felt even further to see, is that cultural change is even harder. Do we have any Germans, Austrians, or Swiss people in the room? Raise your hands. We have one German. Okay, bro, you're representing the whole Germany right now. So imagine that you take this German guy and you bring him into Latin America. And uh, he's meeting all these people, right? And he's very enthusiastic about living in Latin America. Let's say, let's pick up a nice country like uh, Cuba, where the weather is great. He says, okay, guys, let's meet at 7 for dinner. He's going to be there at 6.50. And everybody there is going to be like at 8.30. And they're early. The ones that are late, they will arrive like at 10. And everybody's going to be happy but him. Why? Because he has a different conception about time. And Latin American people, we also have a different conception about time. Sorry, not only Latin Americans. All different cultures have a different conception about time, especially the Hispanic culture. And so the same would happen, for example, if you bring a Colombian guy like me into the Netherlands where they are fucking crazy about the time. And then he's like, hey, bro, like, let's go meet for dinner at 7. And you arrive at 10 and your friends are pissed and you don't really understand what is going on. So <laughs> it's not me. It's a friend of mine, another Colombian guy. Uh, so... Companies fail at seeing that cultural changes are hard that it, because they're not used to it, right? So if, if, you have, if you are a company that is used to changing your culture all the time, first I would say that there is something wrong with your company, but also you would be used to cultural change more often. So this is another problem that they fail at seeing. And uh, do we have any Hispanic people in the room besides me? There was a Spanish guy. Okay, one. Okay, besides him, who knows who is this guy? Who is that? Where are you from? Lithuania, okay. Ah, oh, but you've been to Colombia. No, it's, it's not fair. Okay, cool. So, a little bit of history. This is Simon Bolivar, a.k.a. El Libertador. This is the guy that helped us, Latin Americans, to free ourselves from the Spanish Empire. I'm really sorry to bring this up right now. <laughs> if, you guys, if you guys have studied a little bit of history, you would know that the whole America was under the Spanish Empire. And at some point, the Portuguese came, and the English, and the French, and everybody wanted a piece of our land. And right, so this kept going on for 400 years or so, 450, 50, 500, I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. The thing is that uh, he, he went, he, he got married to this girl. He's from Venezuela originally. He got married to this girl uh, back in the 18th century, and then they went uh, to, they came to Europe to spend their, their honeymoon, right? Because he was an aristocrat, he had money, he could uh, afford such a trip. So they come to, they come to Europe, and then she dies <laughs> from yellow fever, fuck. And so, and so the, the, he, he's like really, really heartbroken. But one of his uncles, uh, one of his good friends, Simon Rodriguez, he was like, dude, don't be sad. Like, you should use that, that sentiment that you have of sadness and canalize it into something better, like revolution, maybe like freeing Latin America. And he's like, oh, bro, I'm dealing already with the death of my woman. Please just leave me alone. But it, it, there was a bug that he had inside, right? He was like, well, maybe, maybe I can do that. Maybe, maybe, you know what? I'll do that. When they were in Italy, it's like, you know what? From here on, I'm going to work on the project of liberating America from the Spanish uh, Empire. And so he goes back to, to Venezuela. He's like, listen, guys, right now, Napoleon invaded Spain. And in Spain, there is guerrillas that they want to free Spain from the French Empire. And we can do the same here. And the people were like, fuck off. Like, no, that, why do we want to get rid of the Spaniards? We're just fine, just like we are, you know? It's like, why do we want to leave Waterfall? We're fine with it. Why do Scrum? And so nobody would listen to him, and he was so desperate. But Napoleon, being the big dickhead that he was, he sent pamphlets all over the Americas to say, hey, you do not belong anymore to the Spanish Empire. You now belong to the French Empire. And th this meant two things. The first thing that it meant was that now Simon Bolivar's word gained a little more weight. And the second thing is that they thought, hey, you know what? 
maybe this can, can maybe we're up to something here. So it slowly started, right? So then he started building a coalition of people and then they started killing Spaniards and then kicking them out and they signed the independence agreement, which was not valid for, I don't know, a bunch of years. And, and then he had to skate back to Europe. Then he came back, freed Venezuela, freed Peru, freed Colombia, made it a really big country. And the revolution was never going to be stopped. From there on, we would become free. Argentina, Bolivia, everybody followed up. Everybody, everybody, the whole thing, the whole thing. It was super crazy. So you can imagine yourself being Simon Bolivar and coming to Devil's Pro and seeing, yeah, CICD pipelines, that makes sense. Yeah, containerizing applications, that makes sense. Yes, orchestration tools, yes, yes. Treating your infrastructure as code and keeping it in your source code, that makes sense. Let's do that. And then you come back to your company and somebody says, yeah, containers, nah. Ah, oh, yeah, no, I'm not sure about Agile. <laughs> uh, come back, nah, get one, nah. <laughs> you know, so you will meet resistance. Just like Simon Bolivar went there and nobody believed in him. But slowly, more people will come to your company because they go to conferences, because they read articles, because they do experiments at home in the night when they are like super lonely and sad. And it's like, oh, what should I do now? Oh, I'm just going to do a Docker exercise. <laughs> you know, or watch Netflix, whatever. And so then people will come slowly to the company and the voice is going to start like a slow rumor, right? Like, hey, did you see Docker? Did you check out this? Did you check out Ansible? Did you check out this Kubernetes thing? Did you check out the, you know, like the little voice and it's there, the, uh, so rumors, rumor, 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 and then the voice starts gaining some weight. Then it starts taking shapes, taking form, and then the revolution will slowly start happening. But it doesn't happen just like that, right? Because if you're just a mere developer, probably in the upper levels of management, they don't listen to you. Maybe there is something missing there. And this is what I bring up, uh, what I want to bring up, a strategy for success. If you are trying to drive change within your company, be it for uh, CICD pipelines, be it for an agile methodology for working, be it for pair programming even, you know, something as simple as that. And if it is not working, well, there is actually a formula for success. You need to choose your lies. Right? You need to choose who is the right people that are gonna that you're gonna work with so that they can help you drive this change. These are some people that need to believe in the same things that you believe. You need to build the right team, right? So the idea would be all the people that, that have that predisposition for technology and for cutting edge technology, you put them together in a team to work on a small project that is not too big, that is not too difficult to refactor, that in case that you need to refactor, you can. And then slowly move forward with that. You need to choose the right project. So that's what I was saying. Small iterations, embrace failure, because of course in the beginning it's gonna be really hard. You're gonna fail, you're gonna break the system. The CICD pipeline is not gonna be perfect from the very beginning, but you need to embrace that failure and work around it or learn from it and move on. And be ready for the inception because from the very beginning, people will be like, these guys are crazy. These are just uh, hipsters and they're just enthusiastic about this new hype technology that in six weeks is going to be over, you know, because everybody thinks, I think that the, the software development culture, culture has been harmed by the amount of JavaScript frameworks that we release every day, you know, because then everybody thinks that any new technology is just like a new JavaScript framework. So you need to be ready for the inception because from the very beginning, people are gonna be looking at you and laughing at you and not believing in you, but at some point when you succeed, they're gonna be like, hey, that what you're doing? How do you do that again? Small iteration, so you like, you commit and then it goes to production immediately, what? I want that. And it's like, ah, so now you want it, okay. So then the, the change is gonna be driven from, from them and not you anymore pushing them towards the change. And this is something that my friends keep telling me on, I don't know why, but you should seek professional help. In the sense that, because you're a pioneer in this area in your company, you need, to set the, you need to set the baseline. And if you set a crappy baseline that is not quality, that is not good enough, when you finish that and it is working, even though it's crappy from, from the bottom up, people are gonna copy it. So what do, they want, what do you want them to copy? A solid guideline for developing software and for delivering software, high quality software, or do you want them to copy your buggy, duct taped CICD pipeline? So in the beginning, it looks pretty much like this. There is a bunch of ideas. What do we use? Shall we use, uh, shall we start with TDD? Shall we start with CICD pipeline? Shall we migrate to Git? Shall we do Agile? Shall we do the Kanban? So there is a bunch of ideas. Then you just try something, just pick up something and stick to it, see if it works. 
Then you're going to go to phase two. When things start a little bit make more sense, and then in the end, you're just going to go on a strike. Then, 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 it's, then it's just very clear what, 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 where you need to go. But you need to start from somewhere. And in the beginning, it can be very confusing because there is a bunch of ideas. But as you move on, everything starts making more sense. Sometimes you will hit a wall, then you need to take a step back, refactor, rethink, and then move on again. And one last thing that I want to talk about is about leadership. How many of you guys, how many do we have in the room that, that have um, decision-making power within their uh, companies? Managers, spreadsheet filters, all that, graph, graphers and all that, yeah, okay. There we go. So leadership is not something that only is given as a title. Leadership is something that comes from within the person. You know, you can have a manager that has no leadership skills at all, yet they are there for, us for a certain reason. And what we have found out is that the best person to drive change within a company, to lead a team to drive the change, is someone called the strategist. This is someone that has a really, really good idea and understanding of reality. It's someone that has the empathy, right? So they, they, people like them, people like to talk to them, and people seem to listen to these people for one reason or the other. So the people have the voice and they have the vision. They, they sort of know what is coming up ahead of the road. Then you have other sort of leaders. It's called the projectionist. It's the person that has uh, imagination, vision, and voice, but somehow they don't have a clear understanding of reality. What is more, they create their own reality without trying to offend anybody. They're sort of autistic. They're in their own world, and it's like, you know what? We need to do Haskell with React and whatever to the look for the login page. And okay, maybe it's beautiful and yeah, good technical challenge to solve, but it really is not something that we need. But because these people have the voice, they impose the need on the people that are below them. So this is a very dangerous person to have in your company. Then you have the anger engineer. And I think that pretty much a lot of us in this room are like this. This is the, we are people that we do have the understanding of reality, the imagination and the vision. We know what is good for the company, but somehow it seems like they don't listen to us. Like you say, hey guys, we need to fix this problem. But no, you just, the company just keeps on going, doing the same thing, committing the same mistakes. And then all of a sudden comes a consultant and say, hey, we need to fix A and B. And they're like, yeah, we need to fix A and B. And then the person is like, oh, God damn it, I've been saying this for a year and you won't listen. Why is that? Because you lack of the, of the social skills to be listened, to communicate the ideas. You know, it, this, is, this is a very common problem in the industry because... A lot, of, a lot of really good engineers, they lack of the social skills. So they are not listening just because of that. And then you have the fantasist, which is someone that has a lot of imagination, voice, and vision, but they totally lack of the understanding of reality and the empathy. So what you could do is to find someone within your company that has all these skills, but this is really hard. This is, these are like unicorns. And so the best way to go is to find someone that, two people, that one that has imagination, vision, and voice, and the other one that has understanding of reality and empathy. You put them together, working together, so that they can drive the change within the company, and that is the easy formula for, su for success. Thanks. <laughs> wow, I guess that's for questions. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Now let's go to the part of the questions. So here is a lot of people, so probably somebody have a question. Oh, very far. Um, maybe you can try to talk loudly and we throw, will try. Throw him the microphone. I think that I can do it. Give me the microphone, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we can make it. Trust me, bro, trust me. DevOps is about trust. <laughs> Oh, it's happening. Oh, cheers. Thank you. Um, coming back to the example that you started your presentation with, um, the failed DevOps, right? You, you tried three things at once. If you could go back to that slide, maybe that would be easier to uh, visualize. I'm looking for it because I don't remember at all what you're talking about. <laughs> right, so you had... Um, 
Is that is that one? CICDC pipeline. Yeah, yeah, it's coming and, up. Uh, right. This one. No, the. Yeah, going back. That one. <laughs> okay, tell me when to stop. Tell me when okay. to stop. Tell me when to. Tell me when to right. just any time, you know. Stop. Yeah. Oh. Back. back. Yeah. Oh, this so one. Okay. Right. Yeah. Too many things at once. Yeah. In hindsight, what would you have done differently? Just now the, that you have the benefit, right? I I would pick one Which and just. One? I love programmable infrastructure, so I would start with uh, programmable infrastructure. But it's better if you just look at the business uh, priorities and see which one which one would bring value the fastest to the company. If there is a bottleneck in creating new servers, for example, like that you need scalability, but people need to manually create machines and manually provision machines, then for sure you can you can bring value to the company by automating all that. If there is a problem with the, with the delivery of the product, because you need to do manual releases, then I would fix that first. If there is a, a problem with the communication and collaboration because the dev development team is in one room and the operational team is in another room, then I will put them together so that they can collaborate and things can uh, work faster. So it's kind of a case by case, yes? Definitely, there is no one size fits all. No rule of thumb there? No. I'm I will, I will, I will, I will throw a dice already. maybe. <laughs> Say what? I was hoping for a for a maybe more uh, helpful answer, but I guess this is a realistic if, one. So. If it if it if it helps, uh, I can I can do two things for you. One, I can give you a hug, and the second thing is that you can come to me for the hug. No, I'm kidding. We can we can take this offline. I would love to hear your case. Okay, thank you. Cool. <coughs> next one. Okay, next one. Oh, you see the question here? Yeah, there you go. Germany, go Germany. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, that I should, okay, I shouldn't yeah, say so that. So I have to be very punctual, right? <laughs> um, go on. Where do you actually see the big difference of the tackling all three things at the same time? Let's say we pick something with very small scope, very small project, and we just don't tell anyone that we do DevOps, but we let people working together on it. And they do PI, but then, eventually have also the pipeline, right? So we actually run three things at the same time. Okay. Well, if you can get away with that, that sounds lovely. It's like giving your kid vegetables without telling them that it's vegetable, but it's actually candy. You say, hey, here, eat this candy in the shape of a broccoli. <laughs> I mean, if you, if, you, if, you can, if you can do that in a very small scope, that sounds great. When it's a small scope and there's uh, low risk, go for it. That's it. That's it. If, if, if it is a big, if you would say, yeah, let's do that. If I do that secretly in the whole company, that sounds more tricky. But you, you, you sound like you have a sneaky little plan going on. So I think that you could totally pull it off. Yeah. Let me know how it goes, though. I'm curious now. Okay, somebody else. There, I saw somebody else. No? Okay, do we have more? I will, I'm, I'm willing to give out Colombian money to the ones that are asking questions. <laughs> I have 15,000 Colombian pesos. That translates like into two euros. <laughs> if that... Big money. Big money, bro. No? Okay, no. Okay, I guess, no. Okay, I want this money, so I will give you the last question. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is, uh, have you experienced what is the main difference between culture in, co in South America companies and European companies? Just one main difference, what do you? Oh my God, I love this one, trust. Trust? Trust, trust because uh, in, in South America, in general, I haven't worked in South America in five years, so I don't know if that has changed, but we are overlooking developers all the time you know like if someone alt taps into a something different hey what are you working on and you know in, in in europe i felt at least in the netherlands that there is a lot of freedom uh, that is given to you you know they trust that you're a responsible uh, mature senior developer and that you don't need to be overlooked all the time so there is a lot of trust going on there is the trust culture right also when you go to the tram you don't need to someone to take check for your ticket they assume that you are paying for your ticket even though we don't do it or you guys don't do it <laughs> But uh, it is like that. Uh, it extrapolates into the industry as well. I've seen that and I love it. I love it because then they just let me do my thing, which is just watch videos all day. And I get paid for it. <laughs>